Well, I heard this story about a highly successful businessman. And uh, he was uh, approached by this charity to make a substantial donation. And so he took the meeting with this charity and they made their case. And it was an urgent need. And they, they needed a lot of money. And so they made their case and he kind of heard them through. And, and he got to the end of their pitch for charity and uh, it, they waited for his answer. And so he looked back at them and he said, well, I can understand why you approached me. I do. I've got a lot of money. And uh, yours is an important cause. But, but are you aware of some of the things that are going on in my life? And they said, well, no, we're not. And, and he looked at them and he said, well, did you know that my mother needs 24-hour nursing care? And no, we didn't know that. Well, well, did you know that my sister is struggling to raise a family of eight on her own? No, no, we didn't know that either. Well, did you know I have one son who's a, in a drug rehab clinic and another who's doing volunteer work overseas? No, no, we didn't know all that either. And he looks at him square in the face and he says, well, if I didn't give them a cent, what makes you think I'm going to give you anything? Right? <laughs> now, now, I know that there's nobody in this room that thinks that way, right? Uh, there's nobody in this room that if, if somebody was in true, genuine need right in front of your face and you know them and you can legitimize what they're going through and you say oh you know what like it's within my power to be able to help and I have this and it's extra I have no doubt in my mind uh, that all of you would help but I don't think that's really the definition of generosity that the early church had um, when we think about generosity we think just about dollars we think about dollars and cents and, and if we're honest uh, America is uh, by that definition, one of the most generous nations on the planet. We're, we're the first to rush into help. We're the first to send aid. We're, we're, our hearts, when we hear a tragedy, we, we instantly think we, we want to be generous and we want to be known as a generous people. But I think the early church had so much more in mind with their concept of generosity. And, and it's this. It, here's their secret that they understood with generosity. Maybe you just want to write this down and then we're going to look at some of the different ways that generosity fleshed itself out. But here was the secret that they understood. What I have isn't mine. It's just mine to steward. They looked at everything they had, whether it was their time, their talents, their treasure, uh, their friendships, their resources, their money, whatever it was. They looked at every single thing in their life, their house, uh, that, that brand new donkey they had outside. I mean, like, that was a thing. Like, that's a joke, people. Come on now. But it's like, Everything in their lives, like their business, every single thing, every breath that they inhaled and exhaled, like everything that they did throughout the day, every friendship, every marriage, every child, everything that was in their lives. They had this one overarching mindset when it came to their viewpoint of everything. This was their view of life. What I have isn't mine. It's not mine. It's just mine to steward. Now, now I, I would say to you that that. The American dream and what we view as sort of life and our view on life is almost the exact opposite of that. Everything I have is mine. And if I choose to give it to you, that's great because I'm a generous person, right? But, but, but their viewpoint went so much further beyond that. They looked at their time. They looked at their resources. They looked at their money. They looked at their health. They looked at their bodies. They looked at their businesses. They looked at their homes. Every single thing they have, they said, God, everything is yours. And you gave it to us as a gift. You put it into our hand. And so God, it's not mine. It's just mine to steward. It's mine to manage. It's mine to lead. It's mine to take care of. But really, God, it's all from you. And so we're going to look at two practical ways uh, of how that viewpoint really fleshed itself out. The first is through resources. And then the second is through something you may not think of. But let's look together in Acts chapter 4 and write this down. This is how they thought about their resources. They thought, my resources aren't mine. They're just mine to steward. And look at what it says in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Now the apostles, Peter and John, have just come back and they've had this semi-trial with the Sanhedrin and the hands of the Sanhedrin said, we can't do anything to you. Like, here's this guy that's been healed. We can't say anything about it. We can't lock you up. We can't kill you because the crowd would turn against us so there's nothing we can say so just don't tell anybody else about jesus don't teach any more in that name do you think they followed that command uh do you think they followed that command no of course they didn't like they told everybody so they go back 
and they find their core group of believers, those thousands of believers, and here's what they did. They started to pray. And they started to pray for more boldness. We look at this passage a few weeks ago. Now look what it says right after that happened. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with what? Boldness. God answered their bold request. And he gives them boldness. And so now they keep going out. Even though there's threats against them. Even though stuff can happen to them. Even though they could get locked up or beaten or whatever it might be. Or even killed. They're still being bold. Now, look at what happens next. Verse 32. Read this with me. What does it say? Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And nobody said that any of the things that belonged to him was what? His own. But they had everything in common now this is not like a commentary on communism okay like this is not like we should all sell everything we have and go buy a farm and like all live together in a happy commune family and like pick other people's corn and you know make vegetables and some people wash clothes and some people grow stuff and some people like work on cars like that's not what the early church is talking about here this was everybody still owned everything on their own but they just said well you know what i own it but it's not mine it's the lord's Like, this is something he's put into my hand. uh, These resources are not mine. They're just mine to steward. Now, look at how this flushes out. This is pretty amazing to me. Look at what it says, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Read this with me, verse 34. What does this say? Read this together. There was not a needy person among them. Whoa. There there are over 3,000 people. In the body of Christ. There are over 3,000 people who are part of community. They don't just show up in a gathering on a Sunday. They they get together all week long in different houses all around the city of Jerusalem. They know one another. They have a relationship with one another. 3,000 people. And there's not a single person in need among them. How is that possible? It's because they prioritized caring for one another over their own personal comfort. Now, now you can hear about a need that's way out there, and it's somebody you don't know, and you can say, I don't know if that's real. I don't know if that's legit. I don't know if, but but if it's a person that you've sat down and had supper with every week, if it's a person that you know what's going on in their life, and it's like, yeah, no, my car is for real broke. Like, it's, I, I came in on duct tape today. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm here at community group, and I'm not sure I'm making it home. Like, can one of you guys be on backup to be able to drive me, right? Like, when you have this situation, and you know, no, you know what? Their spouse has been out of work, and this stuff has happened, and tragedy struck their family, and really, they can't pay their bills like there's nothing they can do in this month they're working extra jobs they're doing these things but they're still in need and in the middle of that moment uh are you going to say well you know i hope that works out for you of course you're not they're your family and so they knew each other and they said well god like this is all yours are you giving it for me to enjoy but it's still yours and so it's not mine it's just mine to steward so god are you telling me To meet their need. Listen, look right here. What if the people in need around you have already had their prayers answered because they know you? They're just waiting for you to pray and talk to God too. In the middle of this moment, look at what it says. So those that were owners of houses or lands, they sold them. They brought the proceeds of what was sold. And they laid at the apostles' feet and distributed it to each as they had need. They would just listen to God and say, God, it's yours. It's mine to steward. And so it's here. What do you want me to do with it? You want me to enjoy it? All right, that sounds great. I'm having people over for a party. You want me to get rid of it? Oh, okay, I'll get rid of it because it's yours. And and so it's just mine to steward. So, okay, like I'll meet their needs. And so look, here's this example of this. Look at what it says, verse 36. So Joseph, who was also called by the apostles, what's his name? Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement. Doesn't everybody need a friend like that? It's like his name is Joseph. Everybody calls him Barnabas because he's the guy who's always showing up and encouraging you. Like no matter what your situation is, he's always got a word that like makes you better, that always lifts you up. Like it's a person that whenever you're around, like this was his whole life. And so because of that, like he he, he's given a new name. Hey, we're not going to call you Joe anymore because Joe just doesn't really fit. Like you're going to be called the encourager. 
You're the son of encouragement because everywhere you go, you just encourage people. Look at what it says he did. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him. So who did it belong to? Who did it belong to? It's my field. Like, it's not the church's field. It's not everybody's field. Like, it's my field. Like, it's been in my family. I worked for it. Like, it's here. It's my field. But what did he do with it? He sold it, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. It, it, everything that I have, it, it's not mine, uh, but it's mine to steward. It's really the Lord's. And so in the course of their time together, he hears of people, friends, family that have these needs. And he's like, I've got this extra field sitting right over here. Like, and they're right there. They can't even eat. Like, what, what should I do here? Lord, you want me to sell it? Okay. Like, it, it's not mine. It's mine to steward, so it's yours. I, like, I love these people more than I love my extra. So, okay, God, like, I'll do that. And he goes and he sells it and he brings it to the apostles so they can give it to the people who really need it. it this wasn't like a one-time thing. In fact, it becomes so popular that the Lord is doing this that people start to make a scam out of it. Like, do you, have you read the next chapter of the book? Ananias and Sapphira, you remember what happened? Like, they're like, we're going to sell our land too because everybody thinks this Barnabas guy's a hero. Like, this is how people really like you. Go sell that extra field we've got. And then we're going to give the money, but we're going to only give part of it, which would have been fine, but we're going to say it was all of it. So people will look at us and think, man, look at those people. They're amazing. I hope I get to be in their small group, <laughs> right? Like, that's what they wanted people to think. And in the middle of this moment, like, the Lord sends his judgment down, and they get carried out by people and get buried, right? I mean, it's like, boom, this is not going to happen. You only do this if the Holy Spirit tells you to do this, but you care for each other in such a way that you're like, God, everything that I have, yes, it came from this place of hard work. Yes, it still belongs to me, but Lord, who's the one who gave me the ability to work? Who's the one who gave me the work in itself? Who's the one who gave me the stuff to make this thing happen? Well, you're the one who did it, so it's not mine, it's yours, so I'm just holding on to it until you tell me what to do with it. I'll enjoy it as long as you leave it in my hand. You tell me to sell it. You tell me to give it. Whatever. It's yours, God. It's just mine to steward. Now, you might think, all right, well, that's, that's fine for, like, people you know. But you know the church's attitude towards generosity extended beyond the people they knew? Go ahead and look beyond that. Flip over to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. It extended to brothers and sisters worldwide. Acts chapter 11, verse 22, uh, they're in Antioch. Antioch, there's Gentile Christians now. And they're like, whoa, you guys believe in Jesus too? This is crazy. You're not Jewish believers in Jesus? No, no, no. It's the Gentile believers. You got the same Holy Spirit we got? Whoa. And so they send who? Barnabas to go and check it out. Hey, we need an encourager to go find out if this thing is legit. Let's send the encourager. Let's send Barnabas. So they send Barnabas over to Antioch, and he's finding out what's going on so he can go back and report to Jerusalem. Hey, yeah, no, this thing is real. It's these people, like these pagans, like you and me. Like, they love Jesus now. It's crazy. All this stuff happened. It's amazing, right? And so this is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. But behind Rome and Alexandria and Egypt, this is the third largest city. It's about 300 miles north of Jerusalem and so there's been this persecution the apostle Paul before he was the apostle Paul back when he was the persecutor named Saul like he stood there and they killed Stephen in front of, of everybody and so people start to leave and so this is one of the places they go and they start to tell people about Jesus and they believe and now they sent Barnabas to go and figure it out now look at what it says the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem they sent Barnabas to Antioch Verse 23, so when he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad. Well, of course he is. He's the encourager. He's always glad. And he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for who? Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called what? Christians. This is the first place the term Christian ever came into being, right? Like, so, so the 
uh, Apostle Paul, he's been saved by Jesus now. Like, he was the reason everybody had to flee because he's coming after the church. But now he's had this encounter with Jesus, and now he's been discipled. And, and there's this brand new church there, and they're like, what should we do? And so Barnabas says, well, I'm going to go get this guy who started all this stuff, but now he loves Jesus. And so we're going to come back and give him a second chance. And he's going to come in, and he's going to be a teacher too. And so they bring Paul in to teach. Now look at what it says. Verse 27. Now in these days a prophet came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was named Agabus. If you're looking for a baby name, by the way, I'm just saying. It's good stuff. Agabus stood up and he foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Look what it says, verse 29. So the disciples determined everyone according to what? What does it say? Read it with me. Everyone according to what? His ability. Everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers that were living in Judea. And they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So here's what happens. This, uh, this guy comes down. He's a prophet. He shows up into a worship service like this. He has the spiritual gift of prophecy. And he says, guys, God's giving me this vision right now. He's telling me there's going to be a worldwide famine. And it's going to hit the people in Judea really hard. 300 miles South of you guys, the church in Jerusalem, where all this stuff got started, the reason you guys know Jesus and you have eternal life, like uh, all, they're going to really, really suffer. And you guys are in the third largest city on the planet right now under the Roman Empire. You guys have a lot. So what should we do about that? And so it says, well, everybody, not just one, not just like, well, the people who had tons, right? No, but everybody. They looked at that and they're like, well, we love our brothers and sisters that are in Jerusalem. They're a different race than us. They're a different nationality than us. But we love them so much like they're like family. So if they're in need um, and we have extra, shouldn't we do something about this? I mean, we shouldn't like prioritize our own comfort where we just pretend they don't exist around the world, right? Like, uh, what should we do? And they're like, here's what we should do. We should set aside a little each week. Everybody, whatever you think you can do. And then we'll just put it aside. And when the famine actually gets really, really bad, we'll send it with Paul and Barnabas. And they'll take it to our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. To these people. We'll, we'll send it to them so they have enough. I love this. It's not just the people you know. But it's like, hey, they love Jesus just like we love Jesus. So we're family. And even though we're like across a sea, like they still should be family. So God, here's all of our stuff. It's not mine. It's just mine to steward. So if I hear this need and you tell me, then like, we should probably do something. And so they do. And they set it aside each week. And then they send it by Paul and Barnabas so that the people in Jerusalem have their needs met during the famine. I, I, I want to show you guys this picture. This is a guy named Pastor Ben. And I had the chance to meet with him. He's a pastor in Myanmar. Myanmar, right beside Laos and Thailand and I had the privilege to meet with him a few weeks ago this guy is amazing uh, he shared his testimony with me and it's a pretty incredible story he grew up incredibly poor like no clothes poor right in this village in Myanmar not enough to eat at all both of his parents died before he was three years old he had to be raised by an uncle who hated his guts he was beaten all the time he wanted to kill himself over and over and over again. His life was terrible. He didn't have enough to eat. He wasn't able to get the schooling that he wanted. Life was just miserable. He were part of a, a group of people in their village. They were animists. And so they would worship all the animals and spirits, right? That's what they thought was real. A missionary came to their village and told them about Jesus and what Jesus has done. That Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sins. That they were loved and they could be adopted into the family of God. And he responded and he surrendered his life to Jesus when he was a teenager. He went to work and he found enough jobs so he could earn his high school diploma. And, and then he went to work and he earned enough so that he could go to a little small Bible college in Myanmar and get his degree so he could be a missionary back to the same village that had been so terrible to him. Well, because he grew up in this village where he was not wanted and there was no kids that, uh, no parents that would adopt him in, he saw kids as something really important. And so he started to 
welcome kids into their home and into their families because he wanted to make sure that they had a place to go and they could experience the love of Jesus just like he did. L listen to me. It's been years now, but this guy, he's a, a pastor. He's founded a Bible college. They have 42 full-time Bible students that he manages. He leads five orphanages that helps care for over 145 kids with no mom and no dad. And get this, I want you to hear what happens in his own personal home. He said, I, I see these kids, and they're in need. What am I supposed to do? I've got to show them the love of Jesus. And so do you know what he did? He has 45 children in his house. 45 kids in his house so that they can get a meal. Now, now I want to tell you, like, they're his adopted kids. It, they, he doesn't even call that one of the five orphanages. But they're that 45 kids. He has six kids of his own. They have over 50 people in a house that's smaller than your house and my house. And I saw the pictures of it. And there's one room where they sleep. And there's this one wall. And it's this one wall of storage. And you see all these towels hanging up on rods across the entire thing. And you know what it is? That's their sleeping mats. And so the kids go. And there's 45 kids laying down on the floor to be able to sleep. And it, they don't have a kitchen. They have an outdoor kitchen that this woman, his wife, and this other lady who stays with them, they have to fix meals for 50 plus people, breakfast, lunch, and dinner over an outside fire. And do you know what he said? He loves Jesus. And he's so excited about what God's using them to do in Myanmar. Like, how can we as believers in Jesus, right? Like, look at situations like that and not feel compassion from the Lord to say, God, you've put so much in my hand. Look, surely you want me to enjoy it, but surely it's not just for me. Like, look at what they're doing with so little. God, do you want me to support the work that they're doing? Do you want me to support the posts in Ethiopia to get street kids off the street? Do you want me to po support the Carnies in Belize as they bring kids in and they do mission trips and they do all kinds of stuff in Belize to transform that country? Like, Lord, you've put so much in my hand, but it's not just for me and it's not just for the people who are right around me. Lord, it, it's yours. And so, God, if you want to tell me to support work around the world for brothers and sisters in Christ, how could we not? Because it's not my stuff. It's just mine to steward. That's what the early church understood. Number two, write this down. It wasn't just in their resources. Write this down. It was also in their forgiveness. It was also in their forgiveness. I don't know if you've thought about being generous in your forgiveness or not before, but I, I just want to read you this story really quickly and then we'll close. But, but it, your forgiveness it is not yours. It's just yours to steward. In the same way that your resources are. I don't know if you've ever thought about that like this before. But look at what it says in Acts chapter 7. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 7. Stephen was this mighty man of God. He was teaching in faith. Uh, the people of Jerusalem, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, they didn't like it. So they captured him. They put him on trial. And he shares this history of the Jewish faith. He's like, we're brothers. This all happened in the Old Testament. And so he goes through the entire Old Testament of what's happened. And then he ends with Jesus. And he says, you guys are so stiff-necked. You're just like your ancestors were. They killed every prophet, and guess what? You guys killed Jesus on the cross. And look at what it says, verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I wish you had more time. Like, here's Stephen, and he's in the middle of this deal, and he's on trial, and they're going to kill him. Look right here. They're going to kill him. Like, they're looking at him, and they've got this rage in their face, and they're like, say one more thing, and I'm going to do it. I swear to you, say one more thing, and I'm going to do it. And he looks at them, and he's staring right back at them, and he doesn't feel any hatred towards them at all. Like, they're going to kill him because he loves Jesus. Not because he's done something wrong, not because he's been immoral, not because he's had some affair, not because of anything that he's done. He just loves Jesus and he's telling him about Jesus and they're going to kill him for it. And they're enraged at him and he's looking at them and he's not even mad. Now, now I want to tell you, 
That is a God thing. I am not there yet. Like somebody does something to me and they're looking at me with rage filled eyes. And you know what I do? Break. Let's do this. Like I'm in rage too. Let's go. Come on. Like I'll, I'll verbally fillet you. Like I will go ahead. Like you just come on. Bring your words because I will cut you down. I could have been a lawyer. Right. Like this is like in that moment this pride wells up in me like how dare you I can't believe that you would say this about me when usually I'm the one who's done something wrong but here he is he's not done anything wrong and they're going to kill him and he looks beyond them and up to God and he's like look at that this is so amazing there's Jesus and he's not seated on the throne he's standing He's waiting for me to get there. This is a like Jesus is like, come on, let's do this. I can't wait to give you a hug, boy. Get on up here. <laughs> he's looking at it. He's like, he's being murdered. And in the face of that, he looks at them and he just sees Jesus. And he's not angry. And he's not upset. And he doesn't match their rage. Look at what it says. This is crazy. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped up their ears. They rushed together in him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice. Here's his last words. You're going to burn, suckers. Is that what he says? That's what I would say. I'd be like, look at what you've done. Jesus is waiting for me, but you all are going to burn for this. That's not what he says. What does he use his last words to say? To forgive. Look at this. Cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep on the ground. That's crazy. That's otherworldly. Do you know how they would stone somebody? I learned something about stoning this week. Not getting stoned, stoning people. <laughs> Just want to make sure that's clear for everybody here. All right, but, but here's the, They would take you out to a cliff that was twice as tall as you were, and they would push you down. They would push you off of it. And the first person who was the first witness in your case, they would take as big a rock as they could, and they would push it on top of you. And if that didn't kill you, then the second witness would come and then they would push a rock on top of you and they would go down through the line until you were dead. They were so enraged with Stephen, they couldn't even follow the process. They just drag him outside of the city and they're like, who's up? And they just start throwing him at him. Literally, he's having stones heaved at his face. Now, I don't know about you. Um, have any of you been murdered this week? And you're still here to tell, if you have, like that'd be an awesome testimony Sunday time. I'm just saying. Like you were murdered and you're resurrected. That's an amazing thing. But like, listen, no matter what has happened in your week, it hasn't been this. No matter what's happened with your kids, it hasn't been this. No matter what's happened in your relationship or your marriage, they haven't done you like this. It doesn't matter what your friends have done. They haven't done you like this. Like he's literally being killed because he says he loves Jesus. And in the middle of that moment, they're heaving stones at his face. And he's not like, oh, praise you, the Lord, hallelujah. Like he's literally being hit and cut and bloodied. And he's losing every ounce of energy that he has. And he doesn't even see them at all. God, I'm so grateful that I'm going to be in your presence in just a second. By the way, like, don't hold this against them. They're just pawns. In the enemy's scheme to make this happen. They're, don't even hold it against them. Forgive them. Now, look at me. If you're a believer in Jesus, the same Holy Spirit who lived in Stephen lives in you. If he can empower Stephen to forgive people who are throwing stones at his face until he dies, then he can empower you to say, well, you know what? They didn't say they were sorry. I can still forgive them. They didn't make amends. They didn't even acknowledge what they did was wrong. 
Well, I can still forgive them. They'll never say they're sorry. They'll never change. They're always going to be like this. Well, I can still forgive them. Now, that doesn't mean that you stay in relationship. Forgiveness is instant. Trust is rebuilt. But in the middle of that moment, you can be generous with your forgiveness. In fact, we're commanded to. Do you know what the Lord says? Look at me and I'm closing. He says, as Christ has forgiven you, so you must also forgive each other. Do you know what would happen if the church did these two things? In generosity. If we looked at everything we have and we said, God, it's not mine. It's just mine to steward. My resources, my stuff, it's not mine. It's just mine to steward. And we actually cared for each other where they could say, there's not a needy person in the church. And you know what? We care about people around the world, other brothers and sisters. And you know what? It doesn't matter what people do against us. We're going to be generous with forgiveness because Jesus was generously forgiving us. Do you know what would happen? It would be the biggest witness to the world on the planet without ever saying a word they would see that Jesus makes a difference in their life let's be generous this